I'm Matthew Kingpin. Ooh, am I excited for this one, friends. As an unapologetic ADHD bicon, I am contractually and cosmically obligated to eventually talk about today's point of discussion. The quite well-known indie hack and slash roguelike slash English majors thesaurical hyperfixation simulator slash homosexual conversion tool, Hades, fully released around half a decade ago as of this video's production. There are many different aspects of the game's design that could easily warrant their own video making about them, and indeed, many such of these types of videos are already in existence, as made by others who have come before me. But today, I'd like to talk about the portion of Hades that stands out to me the most that I have seldom seen the nuance of fully explored elsewhere. This facet being the adaptive difficulty slash progression system, which has been brought up numerous times by other individuals, reviewers, hell, I'm even pretty sure the average stray cat has heard about it, but never understood and appreciated as completely as I've come to. There's much to say about the various systems Hades has in place to encourage your growth both as your character and as you, the player, alongside the many methods it either subtly or more outright strikingly goads the player into making just one more try, all the way to their eventual triumph over the game's trials and tribulations. It's an immaculately interwebbed and coolly crafted Sistine Chapel of game design that I will be delightedly discussing in detail. Spoilers for the whole game are inbound, as always. However, stygious hungers. So let's get into it. Before we begin, I suppose I should give a brief summary of the game for those who are somehow not up to speed on the marvelous misadventures of the maternally missing afflicted Prince of the Underworld, the lovable, laudable, and larcenous Zagreus. You play as, well, Zagreus, as mentioned three seconds ago, whose self-appointed mission is to escape the depths of hell and make contact with his long-lost mother, all the while overcoming the many obstacles put in your way by your fantastic facial-haired having father and lord of the underworld, Hades, whom could be described downright as nothing less than a bit of a fanny, constantly standing imposingly opposed to the inundated prince of the underworld, taunting and teasing the player and telling them they'll never achieve their goal that there is no escape. Thankfully, it's not all doom and moody Death Dad related gloom. There are many different forces that wish to aid the troubled fire-walking father-stressed teenager throughout his beleaguered efforts to reach the outside world. These primarily are Zagreus' immediate friends and or distant family, the mythical Greek gods of Olympus, whom bestow upon the prince a multitude of randomly number-generated power-ups, named boons, which allow him to more efficiently, effortlessly, or imperviously dispatch the many foes your dear old fuddy-duddy of a dad has plopped down in your way. Yes, I said randomly generated, as outside of boss encounters, every run is unique from one another, changing up power-up spawns, the rarities of those said power-ups, and even altering whether or not certain room layouts, special NPCs, enemies, or mini-bosses will appear during the run at all. And between escape attempts, your progress is almost entirely reset, as you lose all of your accumulated items upon bashfully rising from the residential river sticks, reduced to your baseline power but ready to attempt escape again. Potentially with your heterochromia having head in your hands as you die to a spike trap for the fourth time in a row. For those of you who have played the game previously, you might be arising a bit from your pink, blue, and purple gamer chairs to contest that I have omitted large swaths of the game's features from my summary. And you would be correct. But that is because those said aspects are the very things that drive both you and your character forward to succeed. Which means I will be eloquently elaborating about each and every one of them. I'll start off with the game's titular character, Hades, and just how well he works as a hateable antagonist whom you wholly aspire to send straight to hell. Um, again. So what's all the hubbub with the hell reigning hubby? As mentioned previously, with no mincing of words, he's quite the prick, both to you, the player, and to the many NPCs he holds various conversations with, that the ever eavesdropping prince may catch glimpses of here and there. He's delightfully dislikable in a way that makes triumphing over him in any way, big or small, feel incredibly rewarding and satisfying to do again and again and again and again, and you get the point. And so does him, hopefully. 
His booming voice and hoity-toity snide remarks he exasperatedly excoriates the rude remark receiving prince with fuel the player's already seething distaste for the old man with a fresh and never-ending supply of vitriol, even as the hours of failed attempts turn from singular to double digits in length. At times, as petty as it might sound out of context, the simple strategy of persisting out of spite is a more powerful motivator than any glimmering gold pile or comparable prize could ever be. And Demon Dad delivers that in droves. I want nothing more than to wipe the smug smile off his self-righteous countenance. My unlimited hours on this underearth and dignity be damned. There are also many other character-related motivators present throughout the game, including the many NPCs and eventual totally not social links Zagreus has and can interact with between trips through the turbulent trials of the pits of Tartarus and beyond. The ever-lovable goofball Hypnos, who adorably, and ignorantly, yet playfully chastises the player about whatever caused their death in the previous run in a way that makes me simultaneously want to hug him and headlock him. Never has salt in the wound made me feel so sweet. His words remind the player that not only is it okay to die, but the thing that killed you, well, wants to kill you. So if you die from it, that's as much a player failure as it is a pre-planned outcome of design. Although again, remember not to stand on spikes. There's the more outright supportive forces in Nyx, Dusa, Skelly, Orpheus, and the illy protected podiatric famous Achilles, who is absolutely just your second dad. Not like that though. All of whom provide run-to-run -run encouragement and reassurance that your time spent on each failed attempt is slash was not in vain. There's even some more Sundare aid that gets thrown the supremely supplemented in support Prince's way through your not-boyfriend Thanatos and your not-girlfriend Megara, both of whom very much so don't want you to succeed or anything b -b -b baka in a way that makes listening to them almost as cute as the previously mentioned terminally tired god of sleep, albeit in a very different way. Wake up! In addition, there are those special NPCs I mentioned in the last section, whom you can run into out in the hostile halls of hell, each of which has an interesting lore reason for being sequestered away into their own corners of solitude and dismay. That said lore is of course only delegated out to the player in bite-sized bits and pieces. Unless, of course, you'd like to start another run and try to, well, run into them again. Even the region bosses are fine enough motivators to keep you testing your luck. The previously mentioned Demon S. Megara is a wonderfully written rival character for Zagreus to have foisted upon him as his first major obstacle, and the eventual encounter the boss berated prince has with the boisterous duo of Theseus and the Bull of Minos can inspire many a frustration-fueled retry just in an attempt to succinctly smack down the arrogant little Argonaut. And outside of all those lovable lads, ladies, and multimeter tall undying calcium constructed learning lizards, when you're flying solo, you've always got your loyal three-headed hound of hell, Cerberus, there to talk to. As depression-laden as it may sound, based on my own experience with the said condition, sometimes when all else fails, the only thing that can motivate me to get out of bed or climb out of that demoralizing river of blood for the 20th time is getting to pet a good one to three-headed boyo. And hey, since I'm all the way across the hall already, I might as well go ahead and entertain another crack at escaping. Now, all of these character-related motivations are enough on their own. I'm a sucker for good dialogue after all, and this game has some of the best ever. But a really cool secondary aspect to the character interactions, yes there's more, is something that happens during the escape attempts themselves, and that involves the introduction and eventual endowing of nectar. These glimmering bottles of honey colored not honey are highly sought after treats in the underworld that you obtain out during your many turbulent trials and errors, and they also just so happen to make the perfect cheerios for your chthonic chums. Nectar not only allows you to experience the joy of being able to chat up your favorite resident floating gorgon head, but you also get to give her an unexpected token of love and appreciation and delight in her adorable Dusa brand squeal of overwhelming happiness that she expresses from receiving your generous gift of glass-bound gratitude. I personally love presenting people with presents, even when it's down to my last few dollars, or in the game's case, my last few drops of nectar. 
So the motivation that comes from just being able to provide a smile to a loved one makes the endless hours toiling through terrors unspeakably horrible to mankind dealing with the lowest wretches of existence worth it. Oh yeah, and in the game too. As a bonus, all of these previously mentioned characters aren't exactly fans of your olympically forsaken old man either. So as you grow in affection towards them, you in turn grow in antipathy for him in tandem, reinforcing your desire to blast away his brazen affect post haste. Now those are all the things related to the lovable cast of characters, what are some of those other previously alluded to ways the game drives you forward I mentioned? One of them is the between run progression of the slowly strengthening prince through the persistent upgrades he can obtain from plundering his dreadful dad's dread filled domain. As was prophesized in the before times, both figuratively and literally as I will elaborate on later, the realm of Hades holds many hostile inhabitants, terrors both rancid and wretched, but it also holds many resources and random opportunities to make gains that may not immediately be beneficial in nature, but that pay out exponential dividends in future attempts to escape Tartarus's tenacious trappings. These resources primarily come in the form of the previously mentioned bottles of nectar, perfect for furthering friendships and in turn receiving your allies moral rallying and in some cases outright combative support, gemstones which facilitate the construction of beneficial infernal infrastructure such as rooms of respite that provide healing and a break from the unrest of the underworld or dotting the many winding corridors of chaos with loot caches or ceramic containers of coin for Charon, the game's shopkeeper and upcharged goods haver, and darkness which is an amorphous opaque blob designed to provide Zagreus with permanent bonuses up upgrades and abilities that persist even as his body ceases to do the same at each escape attempt's excruciating end. All of these various tokens of growth are given out lavishly through play, either through sheer perseverance of pursuing Icarusian flight from the pits of purgatory, a fitting metaphor as I'll later elaborate, or through a mechanic that makes going for resources less of a steady linear growth, but more akin to assimilating sudden spikes in strength. Prophecies shown through their faded list are various challenges allotted to the player whom's askings of the trial undertaking prince range from both esoteric achievement hunter-esque tasks of experimental play to impossible to miss doses of what amounts to free injections of power depending on the quest given. These milestones allow the game to directly incentivize experimentation of approach through missions demanding multiple methods of play to be explored before a reward is rightfully earned, or even to a lot oftentimes much needed motivation to the player for clearing certain complicated obstacles for the first time. If you will allow me, my dear viewer, I'd like to speak on the example of this that most profoundly sticks with me even years after I first experienced it. When the player finally does actually manage to dethrone their dear old un-undead dad. The game obviously builds up this moment, this glorious apex of achievement and absconding the calamitous clutches of your captor is all but celebrated with a stadium's worth of commemoration as it happens. Not that stadium. But then the game does something extremely sinister. The game waits to hit you with its strongest gut punch only after you've already triumphed over the game's greatest test. Your character, Zagreus, cannot survive outside of the depths of hell. It is bound to them in ways irreconcilable, and he was none the wiser of this fact. Just as Zagreus reaches the surface and finds the object of what could very well have been dozens of hours of playtime and upwards of a triple digit number of attempts to escape, he finds that he cannot truly have that which he has been fighting for all along, and dies in his painfully short acquainted with mother's arms returning all the way back down to the deepest depths of Tartarus, the grim Lord Hades himself waiting to bestow upon the heart-rended and life-ended prince his characteristic snide shattering of Zagreus's hopes and desires. It's a tragedy of, well, Greek nature. In any other game, if I were to reach the reward of my entire playtime's cumulative struggles and find it to be ripped away from me in addition to the game rubbing salt in the wound of my ignorance, I might just be crushed enough to give up. This is especially true in a game like Hades where one's growth of ability to circumvent the game's challenges are by design far more volatile than in a traditional game with more predefined paths of accumulated power throughout the game's runtime. 
I only beat Hades because I had that really powerful boon. I was only able to just barely win with a demigod tier run, and now I have to do it again? Just to die again? This is where both the previously mentioned masterfully crafted cast of characters and the power delegating prophecy system work in tandem to do the most profound thing they could do at this point, and provide one of the most powerful moments of ludonarrative synchronicity and motivation offered by the game as a whole. Allow me to paint the scene. In a frustrated and emotionally compromised state, having been cruelly carted away from your long unmet birth mother's loving embrace, you wantonly walk up to your father and are then subject to having him act in his chronically characteristic, unholier than thou manner, and even go so far as to actively deny and gaslight that you even reached the surface at all. With furious disenfranchisement, you incandescently confide in whichever friends you wish to speak to, seething with equal parts disappointment, rage, and melancholy. Eventually, you'll naturally navigate yourself over to Nyx, a friend and ally strategically placed right next to the entrance to your chambers, the only path that allows the next escape attempt to be made. Even if a player hasn't spoken much to the Night Mother of Many before, they're aware that Nyx knows the most about your existence out of anyone. She acted as your mother by proxy for a number of years. She raised you since you were making itty bitty embered toddles as a tiny baby zaggy. She was the one who orchestrated your escape plan in the first place. Nyx is effectively your strongest ally in these dismal depths of desolation, which begs the thought, she should have told me I wouldn't have survived on the surface. How could she not tell me? You decidedly dash spam right up to her and ask her what she's thinking, letting you ignorantly fail like this. Crestfallen, she states that unfortunately, it was simply just a cruelty of fate, a matter of pure ignorance. Sadly, seeing the future is an ability only a small handful of her fate-knowing and speaking children are allotted. But after your rage burns away, a simple yet powerful quandary is presented by her. If you could only see your mother for a moment's time, in exchange for embarking once again on this odyssey of struggle and carnage, would you still do it? Zagreus, after a moment's pause of deliberation, speaking directly for the player at this point, states with pure certainty, Yes. Yes, I would. At that moment, you take a freshly fanned, flame-bitten step through your chamber's door and are met with a nice big glowing look at me exclamation point on the illustrious faded list of minor prophecies. Which of course you check out, you did just beat your own father, surely there has to be a reward for that. And there absolutely is. Not only do you get a reward for clearing the challenge of curtailing your cantankerous incarcerator, that said reward is a massive chunk of darkness, the resource I mentioned previously that gives you bonuses, extra abilities, and direct upgrades to your character. Up to this point, depending on the run, you might have gotten 150 to 300 darkness per attempt, depending on how many bosses you subdue before you yourself are subdued. With this sequence of events, the game itself is all but outright telling the player through its mechanics, both relational and resourceful, you can do this. You beat him before, and you can do it again. You're more than strong enough. We believe in you. And afterwards, you go on to do just that, and beat him again and again. Even if maybe it takes suffering a few more failed attempts, you're more capable now than you've ever been, both in terms of Zagreus's raw power, and as a player, now being made acutely aware that the phrase, there is no escape, is just as big of a fabrication as you were always assured by your many steadfast allies that it was. I must confess, I lied about what the biggest gut punch of Hades is. In truth, it was never the many crushing blows of despair of being forced back to square one and into that cherry red serene pool of mood whiplash after all of my hard work and perseverance as a player during the run. It was the fact that despite the setbacks, I chose to keep going, due in large part to every aspect of the game's masterclass construction I mentioned previously pushing me to persist onward. Maybe this time will be different, and even if it isn't, there is always the next time. Learn from my failures. He can't keep beating me forever if I do just that. As someone who's faced many struggles in their lifetime, who's dealt with many Hadeses in my limited time on this planet, towering over my taxed person and telling me to give up trying, and that my problems aren't even real, including an actual Hades, except unfortunately there's no eventual happy ending with mine, the jerk. 
Having a game tell me, hey, it's okay to fail when the odds are more than stacked against you, and many aspects of after life are specifically designed for you to fail. It's okay to keep moving forward and to attempt again and again, even as you keep getting knocked down. You're making progress, even if it doesn't seem like it. Your struggles are valid, and you should keep fighting. And when every aspect of the game's design is telling me these things, both through subtle and outright means, that resonates with me more than I could ever describe. I would know after all, I just spent a few thousands worth of words doing my best to do so. Hades is as much a game about extremely attractive mythological men and women, both writing-wise and look-wise, I mean blood and darkness is Patroclus hot, and bone hydra dry humor as it is a metaphor for continuing to persevere, even despite what seems like the entirety of hell standing against you. Whatever your personal Tartarus or Asphodel or Elysium or Temple of Sticks or even Hades is, with enough tries, it can be escaped from. And even if you don't make it out for a long while, if you're dozens or even hundreds of attempts deep, there are people who agree with you that it's unjust that you're in that inequitable abyss, and they'll think the world of you for continuing to struggle and fight to flee from it. Despite what the surface level slogan of this magnificent piece of media might imply, the real message of Hades is actually quite the opposite of that infernal idiom. There is an escape. With enough perseverance, maybe one day we'll all reach it. That's about all I have to say for this production. This video was a massive undertaking. The script writing alone lasted half a day. There's just so much I wanted to say, even after I did my best to follow Chekhov's exegriff and cut out what wasn't needed. Hades is an extremely near and dear game to my heart. I love it enormously, and it's absolutely one of my favorite comfort games as an individual, due in no small part because of the aspects I mentioned previously. I love the humor, the characters, the gameplay, the story, the graphics, the power-ups, the progression loop, the accompanying musical score. So many aspects of this game just click with me. I absolutely wanted my elaboration on the topic of Hades to be one of the things that comprises my legacy as an individual. Oh, and I didn't know where else to put this, but my two favorite characters are Patroclus and Chaos. The former, because I love and relate to him on a profound level, he's literally me guys, and the latter because I love and relate to him on a profound level. She slash he's literally me guys. Anytime I see either of them in a run, I have to stop by and say hello, and then get ass blasted because my chaos curse reduced my health to 12 and I somehow managed to forget how to dodge numbskulls in the time between hitting E on the chaos curse and it expiring. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching. Please give me any and all feedback you have, positive or constructive, in the comments section. It is all read and appreciated deeply. Also, if you're a returning subscriber and you're wondering why you don't get notifications for any of my new uploads, it's because YouTube absolutely murders your analytics if you choose to notify your subscribers of your new content and you're a small channel. So I have that feature disabled. I know it's a little inconvenient and I do apologize, but I do want people to watch these. If you want more direct updates on when I make new stuff, I have a dedicated Discord channel where they get posted every single time a new production gets released, which can be found linked to in the description below. Earn your dread, go into the future, and I'll meet you there. Oh yeah, before you all go, I just wanted to mention that you should all like, comment, share, and subscribe- ah! Wow! It says here that you died of excessive cringe! I hear that gets a lot of people these days. Have you considered trying, I don't know, being based instead? Sorry mate, that suggestion doesn't sound very skibbity toilet of you. It's one heck of a killer! Blood and darkness. Where's that blasted boy? You impudently spent my realm's precious supply of gemstones on Megara's only fans? Um, father, it's called only fans. You know, like after Thanatos. Father. <laughs>